This morning, it is my privilege to introduce practitioner Sandra Cooper, who is my combolo. Her talk this morning, I'm sure, will encourage and inspire and incite you to expand that vision of who you are and to give, to enable you to put into practice some of those things that we need to do to keep us on the path. And so, Ms. Sandro, I am honored to be sharing the platform with you now. Thank you, Ms. Carol. Good morning, friends. It is truly a joy for me to add my words of welcome and to welcome each and every one of you to my, to my heart. We, we are this morning faced with a, what you call a smorgasbord of, of awesome offerings. And so I'm going to ask that you just relax. And um, this is a little bit outside of our time format, but it, I'm sure it is going to, you're going to leave with a belly full. I also would like to add my um, special words of welcome to all those wonderful souls that are joining us um, on the World Wide Web. Now, the story is told of an elderly lady who was traveling by air to visit her family overseas. On the aircraft, she was seated beside a well-dressed gentleman. After the in-flight in meal, she took out her Bible and began her devotion. The businessman glanced at her and said, do you really believe all those stories that the Bible tell you? Do you think that they are true? She says, as a matter of fact, I do, replied the, the woman. Yeah, right, the man scoffs. Like, what's that guy's name again, the one that got swallowed by the whale? Um, um, uh, Jonah. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, I mean Jonah. I mean, how can somebody survive for three days inside a whale's bowel? I don't know, replied the old lady. But I can ask him when I see him in heaven someday. <laughs> Feeling smart, the young man said, OK, but what if he's not in heaven because he went to hell? Then the young, then young man replied the old lady calmly, you can ask him. <laughs> <clears throat> Stories of heaven and hell were fed to me as part of my early religious upbringing along with other offerings about temptation, sin, and the devil, God's vengeance and judgment, the value of pain and suffering, and the inherent evil that existed in the world. In spite of the wonderful Bible stories and teachings that were also presented, my impressionable young mind filtered and absorbed mostly those pronouncements declaring me a worthless sinner with unredeemable qualities which guaranteed that in my afterlife, I would be headed down south for sure. What made me feel just a little bit better was the invitation that all was not hopelessly lost. There was indeed one redeeming factor, and it was that if I repented and accepted Jesus, I would be saved from being the main course at my own barbecue. So with this kind of upbringing behind me, along with deep, deeply rooted ideas about God, the devil, temptation, sin, heaven, hell, and the like, it was truly a blessing and a relief to discover religious science and to gain a more positive, life-affirming presentation of these common biblical tenets. One such um, discovery was the way in which the science of mind looked at the idea of being saved. So I thought I would take the time this morning to share a little bit regarding the truth about salvation, what it is and what it means to us as practitioners of the science of mind. According to the online dictionary Wikipedia, salvation is defined as deliverance from danger or suffering, preservation from loss or calamity. To save, therefore, is to deliver or protect one from some dire situation. Different religions hold irreconcilable positions regarding the meaning of salvation and the actual way of being saved. According to most Eastern religions, humans need only to know the right things in order to be saved. Through personal effort, devotional rituals, meditation, individual discipline, and spiritual practice, 
These religions state that all people have everything they need inside of themselves to enable their own salvation. Christianity, on the other hand, holds the opposite view, stating that humankind's true inner nature is sin, and therefore all efforts aimed at earning God's favor were useless. Salvation is stated as a saving of the soul from God's wrath, brought about by the sins of mankind and their consequences. The understanding is that one will be granted a reprieve from God's judgment along with admission to heaven when one accepts Jesus as the one true savior. Christianity's primary premise then is that the incarnation and sacrificial death of Jesus formed the climax of a divine plan for humanity's salvation. It is argued that we cannot do anything to deserve salvation, but must only accept God's grace and the role of Jesus Christ as savior and as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Being, therefore, being saved, therefore, is a goal toward which every good Christian has to strive, made even more necessary when natural urges run smack into the wall of morality and religious beliefs. Imagine what happens to a young child who is told that he's born in sin and shaped in iniquity. He's bound to feel worthless and never, ever good enough. Those feelings follow him for his entire life and are further compounded by fear, which in turn is a powerful means by which people feel compelled to seek salvation. And here's an example. A friend of mine shared with me that when he was about 13 years old, he accepted Jesus as his savior. Later on as an adult, he was able to work out the psychological manipulation that made him answer the altar call. According to him, the pastor started out by making every thought that passed through his adolescent 13-year-old mind wrong. And can you imagine those thoughts? And the absolute, those thoughts the pastor told him were the absolute evidence of sin. He learned that everyone and everything around him was part of the irredeemable culture of sin. And this made him so deeply fearful that he began to have nightmares. The more awful and fearful he felt, the easier it was for him to accept the olive branch of salvation. However, in spite of his being saved, he continued to struggle with thoughts of his inherent wickedness. And for the next 40 years of his life, engaged in that daily battle with his inner de demons of guilt and shame. Thankfully, it does not have to be this way. The science of mind provides what, for me, is a most refreshing perspective. In this teaching, we learn about how the mind works. We learn that many of the beliefs we have about right and wrong, good and bad, come from our early programming, which in turn affect the way we act and react to people and events. The founder of our teaching, Dr. Ernest Holmes, presents the following ideas regarding human salvation. According to Dr. Holmes, the mystics have taught that evil is not God-ordained, but an illusion. And while there may be the appearance of evil, in truth, there is no devil, no hell, no torment, no damnation outside of one's own state of thought. No punishment outside of that which is self-inflicted through ignorance. And no salvation outside of the conscious cooperation with the infinite. Heaven and hell then are states of consciousness. And the answer to every problem, therefore, is in man's own consciousness. No one, he states, judges us but ourselves. No one gives to us but ourselves. And no one robs us but ourselves. The problem of good and evil will never enter the mind which is at peace with itself. When we make mistakes, we suffer the consequences. When by reason of enlightenment and understanding, we correct those mistakes, we no longer suffer from them. Understanding alone constitutes true salvation, either here or hereafter. What more can life demand us, that, um, according to Holmes, than that we do the best that we can and try to improve? If we have done this, we have done well, and all will be right with our souls, both here and hereafter. This leaves us free to work out our own salvation, not with fear, but with peace and quiet confidence. Our place hereafter will be what we have made it. If we have lived in accordance with the law of harmony, we shall continue to live after this divine law. 
If we have lived any other way, we shall continue to live that way until we wake up to the facts of being. To awaken oneself is to be healed, made prosperous, happy and satisfied. To be whole and complete as we were intended to be. God is a God of the living, not of the dead. God sees and knows only perfection and completion, happiness and satisfaction. When we shall know ourselves as God knows us, then complete salvation will come to us. The way of salvation, then, is through the realization of man's unity with God. We are saved by God's grace to the extent that we believe in, accept, and seek to embody the law of good. For the law of good is ever a law of liberty and never one of limitation. Salvation in its essence, then, means liberation from ignorance. And as one writer refers to, as stinking thinking. It is an act of man and not an act of God. As Holmes states, man will save himself to the, ex to the exact degree that he stops damning himself. He will live in heaven when he stops living in hell. He will be healed when he stops being sick. He will become rich just as soon as he stops being poor. He will be happy when he stops being miserable. He will be at peace when he stops being confused. He will be filled with joy when he stops thinking sadness. And he will live when he stops dying. He will be perfect when he stops looking upon imperfection. In essence, this is the mandate that we have been given. Joshua 24, 15 tells us to choose ye this day whom you will serve. <clears throat> because it is by the choices we make that we determine the extent to which we grow and enable the deep human desire toward full, um, betterment. What we need to be saved from then is the dominant tendency of our own thoughts, especially when they go south. The good thing is that every single day presents opportunities that put us at choice regarding the quality of life that we can experience moment to moment and enables us to facilitate our own salvation. Whether it is through work, relationships, decisions, actions, or reactions, if we ascribe to the belief that we are whole and complete and at choice, we become the architects of the quality of life that we want to experience. The science of mind provides learning that helps us deal with the issues of daily living. In this teaching, we learn that there is one and only one presence and power expressing through our life, and we are one with it. We'll, we learn spiritual mind healing treatment. I heard one of our practitioners mention it this morning. And we learn that it enables us to heal ways of thinking that are rooted in fear and limitation. So that we, as we change our thinking, we change our lives. We learn that no matter what is swirling around on the outside, God is equally evenly present in all people and in all circumstances. And that there is really nothing to fear, only God to know. We learn the nature of forgiveness and how it enables us to release old hurts and resentments against others. We learn to be patient with ourselves and respectful of others, knowing that we are all learning and growing together. We learn to let people be as they are doing the best they know how at their level of consciousness. We learn to see the wholeness and perfection in others as they are themselves expressions of God. We learn to set and pursue goals that are intended for only the highest good and which hurt or manipulate no one. I now like to invite to the podium someone who will share with you for one minute, I told her five, but now I'm cutting it down to one, what she has learned and how she has used the science of mind to free herself from limited thinking and create a new life experience for herself. Please help me welcome Mrs. Cynthia Bellanfonte. Good morning, everyone. Okay, I grew up learning that salvation is something that you achieve at the end of your life. Also, some of the statements that I heard is that Jesus is my savior and he has to save me and I must be baptized in order for him to give me salvation. Also that salvation means not going to hell or heaven and 
if I did not meet these requirements, then certainly I would be going to hell or heaven thereof. These are some of the things that really, the statements that really propel me to, go on the to be on the treadmill of life, trying to find salvation. I was so terrified. I had sleepless nights, anxiety, fear, and emotional distress, to name a few. I would lie awake at night trying to assess my situation. Was I in? Where was I? Hell? Heaven? Which one? I was so traumatized, so much that I would visit all the different places of worship trying to get this salvation, only to return home feeling worse. Coming to the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living and doing the, work, the courses that are being offered here has allowed me to have a true understanding of what salvation is. Salvation now for me is a freeing of the self from bondage, from limiting thoughts, limiting beliefs, and ignorance. Salvation liberates me to have a better and better relationship with myself, with God, and with others. Salvation for me now is knowing, is knowing the truth which allows me to be the person that I want to be, to do the things that I want to do, and to have the life that I want to live. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. And I, I, I'd like to endorse that. I do invite you to choose to do a class over the next couple of weeks. It surely will open up the science of mind and, and allow us to really understand our relationship with ourselves and our relationship with, with our Creator. I don't believe that there is really any need, though, to seek salvation, as the only thing that we need to be saved from, as Cynthia said, is limited thinking, which keeps us mired in lack and fear, doubt, pain, and suffering. What we do need is to be awakened to know who we are, com whole and complete expressions of a loving God, imbued with the power to shape and transform our lives to the divine will. Let, let's affirm together. I guard my thoughts and entertain only that which is good and perfect. Together, I guard my thoughts and entertain only that which is good and perfect. I change my thinking and my life flourishes. I change my thinking and my life flourishes. I live by the one power and no thought can enter to disturb me. I live by the one power and no thought can enter to disturb me. I am a whole and complete expression of a loving God. I am a whole and complete expression of a loving God. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are a whole and complete expression of a loving God. One is spiritually centered through an active, disciplined, and regular spiritual practice. There is no room in consciousness for any sinful thought, and therefore no negative consequences to deal with, and therefore no need for salvation. I invite you to never again tell yourself that you are poor, sick, weak, or unhappy. Instead, affirm that you are healthy, wealthy, strong, and joy-filled. No more guilt or shame. Um, Jean, um, if I remember, there's a book that's called No More Smalling Up of Me by Jean, Wil Jean Wilson, a poem. Right, No More Smalling Up of Me. So I invite you to, to embrace that idea for yourself. Never, want it, never again to say any negative thing about yourself. Daily speak your truth to your inner being, telling yourself that you are wonderful and marvelous. Whisper these things into your soul until it sings with the realization of its divinity and its limitless possibilities. Friends, today is a day of complete salvation. Not tomorrow, nor the day after, but right here and right now. I invite you this week to contemplate the idea, examine it closely, 
dance with it, try it on, chew on it, and fully and powerfully experience it as your truth. Namaste. Yeah.